Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, Hiran Kure, chairman of Jetwing Hotels, gives us his unique perspective as we focus on the tourism industry. Then, Shaheen Kader, Nielsen's managing director, analyzes the BCI, which made a dramatic turnaround. And finally, Dashal Dimel, economist and LMD columnist, gives us his take on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. He was a former chairman of the Pacific Asia Tourism Association, what we know as PATA, and recently he was appointed the president of the Hotels Association of Sri Lanka, the apex body of the hotel sector in the country. He also sits on the ethics committee of the United Nations World Tourism Organization. In our studios today is Hiran Kure, chairman of Jetwing Hotels, and he's going to take a closer look at the hotel sector in Sri Lanka. Good to have you on the show, Hiran. Thank you, Savitri. Nice to be back. Indeed, indeed. Do tell us, how do you view the prospects of the hotel sector in Sri Lanka, especially the boutique hotels? Well, everybody is doing well. I mean, not only the boutique hotels, but in general, all tourism, uh, hospitality people are doing well. But there is, of course, the boutique hotels being that niche segment has that extra, you know, the, 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 you, you are catering to a different type of clientele and that, that excitement, the love, the passion uh, to, to welcome people, you know, maybe the celebrities, maybe somebody who's, you know, the discerning travelers. So yes, so, so those who are in that boutique segment enjoys that comfort, the luxury of serving those who are more discerning travelers. But I must say that not only the boutique sector, but all sectors are doing well now. That's indeed a relief after yes, years. Yes, of course, of after so many years of uh, struggle and that we, for the last five years, we've had uh, stability in the country and that's what's uh, paying off now. What do you think of Sri Lanka's tourism agenda? Well, I think we, we are, we, you know, uh, since 2009, we just re started reaping the benefits. We didn't have a proper plan, we didn't even market the destination, just purely on peace and stability, the tourists started coming. I think now it's time for us to sit back and plan for the future, maybe the next 20 years, 40 years, whatever. Because if we are to talk of a proper agenda, I think one thing that we have, which is so good in our country, is the greenness. You know, we are naturally green. Not that, uh, not that anybody has planned, we, we still have close to 47% of our country green. That of course includes the plantation, tea, uh, rubber and coconut and of all the, the forestry sector, you know, about 23% uh, is under forest cover. So that's, I, I don't think anybody's planned for it, you know, but it's just happened. So we have to preserve that and whenever, wherever we build hotels, obviously we destroy the nature. We have to accept that wherever we build, we destroy. So we have to then protect it. You know, now we, on our own, we have our example of jet wing will you know, where we have enhanced the habitat by creating water, collecting lakes and all of that. So the wildlife has, where there was no wildlife, wildlife has come in. So there are examples, I mean Kandalama Hotel for example, you know, uh, where, where these are all international landmarks now. So we had to talk of, you know, doing those good things. So preserving the nature as much as possible while we benefit from tourism. And in also including, uh, in, involving the local communities, making sure that they benefit as much as possible. So once those are included in the agenda, I think tourism can prosper. Are we playing to our strengths, you think? Well, yes, because I think the biggest strength we have is a beach, whether we like it or not, being on an island, you know, the, the beaches are the best, some of the best beaches we have in the world. We need to really capitalize on that a little bit more because that's to me the strength and the people, 
you know we also don't market our people very much we we let's face it we have we have the buddhism uh, christianity islam hinduism no other country can boast of all these main religions in the world flourishing and the friendly cheerful people you know because we all don't forget we had a bad image in the world right of so many years of war killing and that's what's still going out i think another strength we have is the you know the friendly warm hospitable people and we need to start marketing that uh, to the rest of the world and uh, so those two strengths plus of course culture nature all of that so to answer your question we can do better ahiran um there has been a considerable paradigm shift to sri lanka's hotels actually trying to attract the higher end tourists so there is that argument that we need to maybe concentrate more on the mm-hmm. high end tourists and a smaller number rather than the other way around what is the right type of tourist that sri lanka can attract <laughs> that's a million dollar question i mean uh, to me i don't think there's a right type of tourist because any country needs both segments we need the backpackers also don't forget today's backpackers can be tomorrow's uh, high end traveler right and they are the explorers they'll go into areas that no other people go to you go to ella today i mean you will be surprised at the number of people who go to ella i mean you know we were surprised we i mean we never thought of uh, ella before i mean now we are looking at doing a hotel in vellava because of the people and that's again it's a backpackers who went and explored and they started trekking there walking there and then you know so that's so we need that i think the ideal balance is 50 50 if a destination can say we have 50% high end 50% you know the ordinary travelers whatever it is i think that will be fantastic because we can't be so choosy and say hey we want only people who will pay 500 dollars a day or more i mean that's that's i mean and and very recently i i attended a, a accessible tourism conference the first ever of its kind in the world and i was the only asian in that conference and what they are talk first i thought accessible tourism is only for those uh, you know differently able people who, you know who cannot who do not have the sight or maybe they you know paralyzed whatever it is but they are talking of accessible tourism for, for those who do not have the means to travel as well you know they are talking of why is it that only the rich can travel to destinations and enjoy these benefits why can't the others also them mid income low income people also have benefits now there are countries that have actually worked on this high end <coughs> yeah. formula and done mm-hmm. very well the maldives the seychelles yeah. um so is it that we were just trying to well maldives seychelles has limited capacity and i don't blame them you know when they have uh, limited uh, resources uh, limited space then why not go in for you know the highest possible revenue so in our case i think we are still you know big enough to handle maybe 3 million 4 million tourists so if we are going for bigger numbers and then we cannot say we we want 4 million high end tourists so it's it has to be a mix of both that's why i think uh, and also the uh, sabit don't forget that uh, 30% of the current tourist arrivals go into what we call the informal sector they are not registered with the tourist board they are not registered with i mean definitely not members of the hotels association but these are the homestays little guest houses and that's important also that they make money as well from tourism you know otherwise the local people will have a hatred towards tourism ah it's only the rich who are serving the rich and they benefit only and we don't benefit anything from tourism so i think for the country it's a blessing that 30% of the tourists who come here are staying in uh, staying in the homestays so the you know the the village housewives can make an extra you know uh, income by uh, renting their room for example and that's happening through different websites airbnb uh, all sorts of websites homestay.com whatever and uh, share a meal or you know eatwith.com whatever these these websites some argue whether these are legal or not but that's happening and uh, people are benefiting from this so i think it's it's good to have a good mix that community inclusiveness is yes. is vital yeah. if yeah. we are to keep of a course. sustainable yeah, model yeah, going yeah. 
In fact, Hiran, I think as an island, we are very fortunate that we continue unconsciously sometimes mm -hmm. to have green practices. Yes. Um, are we doing enough, though, where considering <laughs> ecotourism and sustainability practices? I think we can do much more. I think we can do much, much more. Um, uh, you know, there are a few companies who are, who are really engaged in it, who have really embraced it and who have benefited from it. But others, I think, can learn from it. Uh, you know, there, there is nothing to say this is rocket science, right? I mean, uh, and, and there will be, once you do, once you properly practice greening or sustainable, uh, there is economic benefits as well. I always relate it to economics. You know, whatever we do with the local communities maybe or environmental practices or greening practices, it has to be linked to economics because people talk of people, profit and uh, planet. And I always say profit is the most important. If you do not make profit, you cannot look after the people and the planet. Right? I mean, you know, some, sometimes people come and say, oh, we are not interested in profit. We are only here for the sustainability. I think that's all nonsense. You know, it has to be uh, profit driven. So you relate what you are doing, greening or community, to your profitability. Because if you do not make profits, your shareholders are going to scream at you because they are investing not to look after the local community. Okay, that can be a good story to tell. But they, they must also have their returns in fairness to them. So, so a good, good balance is needed. But uh, I think our companies can do a lot more. A lot then more. there's the other side, Iran, where companies are actually proclaiming to do a lot of things, green-wise. But it's more rhetoric and cosmetic than actually the, the yeah, reality yeah. of it. Greenwashing, mm -hmm. to, so to speak. What is your response to those who claim? That They'll they not last long. They will get caught out today. You can, you can claim anything, <clears throat> but the customer is king today. You know, earlier it was only word of mouth. Now that word spreads through the internet. <clears throat> uh, TripAdvisor may be all sorts of social media, right? Now even, even our company, once, once or twice we made a couple of mistakes. Before we could get to know, some of our customers had put it on their Facebook pages, uh, you know, TripAdvisor. So then I had to stand up and apologize and say, sorry, <clears throat> we made a mistake, we'll rectify it. So, I mean, that's, we, we are very strong in uh, uh, the environment practices. <clears throat> but having said that, you make the slightest mistake, they come out. And, and, and that's, that's an immediate check and balance. You know, if the customers say, hey, Jetwing is doing something wrong, that affects our business a lot. So s similarly, those who greenwash, will get caught out much faster and, and won't survive. They won't survive. They can, they can survive maybe three months, six months. The, the customers will, uh, will chase them out. So we'll get back to you. We <laughs> pause for some messages now. And on the other side, Hiran Kure discusses the infrastructure development in the country and also the 2.5 million visitor target Sri Lanka is aiming for in 2016 for the tourism industry. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC.
as soon as my salary goes into my HNB account, my family goes shopping just like a power play. Now with HNB Mobile Banking, wherever you are in the world, you can check your account balance and do your banking with this. Wherever I am in the world, HNB is active on my mobile and tap 24 hours a day. HNB Mobile Banking. Bank anywhere from any mobile. Welcome back to the show. We continue our discussion with Hiran Kure, Chairman of Jetwing Hotels. He's also on the advisory panel of Air New Zealand in addition to being uh, the former chairman of PATA and the current president of the Hotels Association of Sri Lanka. Hiran, if we look at infrastructure development, um, how do you view the current infrastructure development that's happening? I think it's fantastic. First of all, it's, it's good for the people in the country. We benefit the most because we travel on those roads more than anybody else. <clears throat> the tourists come for two weeks and go off. But for tourism marketing, positioning the country, that's very important. I mean, uh, just yesterday we were having a discussion about, uh, you know, people going to Hambantota, for example. I mean, you know, very soon they'll be able to go there in, in three hours or less. So that's fantastic. Or they'll have also the, when we talk of infrastructure, there's also other infra AI infrastructure which is developing. Cinema Nea, for example, or the heli tours that are run by the Air Force. All these, uh, you know, developments are important for tourism. I think another area that we haven't really developed is our sea sea-based uh, you know transportation and all of that if we can develop that area as well i think we are we are in it uh, candy is still a little difficult to get to but they have I'm, I'm told that the the roads have started works have started so so hopefully within the next three years we might have a highway to candy and to the north as well so that'll be great i mean for, to me the most important is the sri lankans because because we live here and we benefit most. And then secondary is tourism. That, that's how I look at it. And I, I'm, I'm very happy to see so much of development taking place. Colombo getting clean. It's a fantastic city to live now. It, it was never so good before. So it's, it's, I mean, to me, it's awesome. We're talking about 2.5 million tourists by 2016. Can the hotel sector accommodate this number? Yes, for sure. Because remember I told you earlier, 30% is informal sector. So I think there might be more informal sector people who will, uh, who will throw out their rooms. So, so it's, it's an additional income for them. So if, even if the hotels cannot fully uh, accommodate everybody, I think the, the, the informal sector will also step in. But, but there are lots of hotels being built, Colombo and outside. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, that, that, that I'm sure is, is not going to be an issue. From the hotel's point of view, uh, we'll be ready to handle. One area of concern I have is the human resource side of it. That's something I was going to ask you about, actually. Uh, has this HR component actually taken the emphasis it needs if we are looking at this number of 2.5? Well, some of them have. They, they are very concerned about it. But also the... the the, the challenge is some, sometimes the youth today, there are too many options and uh, they, they don't commit themselves to a particular industry. So then they want to shift from this, that and the other. And so, so, so the, sometimes we, we put in a very strong effort in training, you know, especially the, if you take the rural youth, it'll take you at least two years to really say, look, this, this boy or girl is now really fit to serve and then you know when they come close to it they'll give up because it's, it's hard work as well it's not only pleasurable work you know you, if you're waiting tables you are standing for eight hours a day and in a tropical country is not easy and and some of them give up some of the kids give up so then then our trainers get disheartened as well my goodness we put in so much effort into training and then here we are no the response is poor, so it's it's a you know battle we have to fight hard to keep, and then there are other industries that are doing well also, so the the kids get uh, snapped up by them. Uh, so it's it's a challenge, it's a challenge, and uh, you know we have to live with it and uh, fight on and keep going. As president of the Hotels Association of Sri Lanka, what is your vision for the leisure sector here? <laughs> well, I think I I articulated the vision a little bit earlier you know i'd like to see the country focusing on the you know the two aspects 
the people and the planet. That is where we can be really happy. Profitability, most of us are making profits, so that's that's a given now. I mean, uh, given that there will be stability in the country, tourists are going to come. But it's very important that we look after the planet, I mean the environment. Because if we, if we, if we ruin the environment, then we are only looking at the short term. So, so for us to uh, for us to have tourism for the next 100 years or more, we definitely have to look after the people and the environment aspect. If we don't do that, uh, you know, it's a short term thing. So here's to your vision <laughs> becoming a reality. Thank you, Iran. Thank you very much, Savitri. Nice to be here. We've been chatting to Hiran Kure, the chairman of Jetping Hotels, on the leisure sector and, of course, the hotel sector here in Sri Lanka. On the other side, we have the managing director of Nielsen Shaheen Kada, who will give you an insight on the Business Confidence Index. And right after that, LMD columnist and economist Deshal Dimel for an update on the economy. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. As soon as my salary goes into my HNB account, my family goes shopping just like a power play. Now with HNB Mobile Banking, wherever you are in the world, you can check your account balance and do your banking with this. Wherever I am in the world, HNB is active on my mobile and tap 24 hours a day. HNB Mobile Banking. Bank anywhere from any mobile. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. We'll now take a closer look at the latest Business Confidence Index with the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. Now, Shaheen, the BCI has gone up to a 20-month high. Now, what are the reasons that have led to this? Well, Anushan, the consumer confidence is coming back in, in a fairly big way. I mean, the feel-good factor is returning. Uh, we see the consumer confidence index at a, again at a, almost a two, two-and-a-half-year high, a sharp increase. Uh, so, which has an impact on business. So, when consumers start spending, obviously businesses improve. So, there is a, there is a, an impact on the business confidence index in a positive, uh, in a positive sense. Where does the business sector stand in terms of the economy, Shine? I think uh, businesses uh, are fairly confident of, uh, I think, the next few months. So, we do see a uh, positive sentiment going forward. What are your projections for the near term based on your poll findings? I think, uh, I mean, the big, big ele the elephant in the room or in the arena is, is the elections. And I think both, both, both groups, both, both candidates are pro-business. So I guess, I, I mean, I don't see the invest business climate really sort of going down as such. So hopefully we would see a continuation of the, the pickup that we have seen. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. After a short commercial break, we will be back with the latest on the economy with economist and LMD columnist, Deshal Dimel. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed.
We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. As soon as my salary goes into my HNB account, my family goes shopping just like a power play. Now with HNB Mobile Banking, wherever you are in the world, you can check your account balance and do your banking with ease. Wherever I am in the world, HNB is active on my mobile and tap 24 hours a day. HNB Mobile Banking. Bank anywhere from any mobile. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. Let's take a closer look at the economy with economist and LMD columnist Dashal Demel. So Dashal, just give us a brief overview of the economy at this time. Yeah, Anushan, in the last uh, couple of months we've seen some improvements in uh, the data that we generally track. For example, things like uh, private sector credit growth we've been, we've been concerned about for the last couple of years now. But in the months of August and September there's been some uh, growth in private sector credit. That's a good proxy indicator of overall economic activity. Uh, so, for example, in September, there was a 52 billion rupee increase in uh, lending to the private sector, a lot of which uh, appears to be in terms of uh, increasing term loans. So, what we are seeing is a, that's a, a probably an indicator of improved uh, economic activity overall. And that's a positive. There's possibly some cyclical uh, element to that, but uh, hopefully there'll be a structural element as well, which would be then sustained going forward. Uh, also on the import side, we've seen a pickup in terms of uh, d uh, demand for imports as well. So that's again a, an indicator that maybe the consumption side is finally picking up uh, as well. It's probably still too early to see whether that's again a, a sustained uh, growth going forward. But uh, overall, I think that's a, a positive kind of indication that there's been some pickup on the consumption side, which is really what has been missing in the economic picture for the last, say, 18 months or so. So that's a, it's a positive overall in that sense. Now, the government maintains that agriculture is top priority and has been allocating a substantial amount uh, from the budget for that sector. Now, but as seen in recent years, the actual expenditure has been far less than uh, what has been budgeted. Now, could this disparity between budgeted and actual spend impact the sector? I think that's a, a, f a phenomenon that kind of affects across the board. What we've seen in the last, say, uh, two years, I'd say after 2012, uh, has been that government's budgeted revenue has come below the actual revenue, right? And we've seen that for the last uh, two years. What happens then is that in order to maintain the fiscal deficit target, the government ends up cutting back on certain elements of expenditure. Now, what we've seen is uh, the, I haven't looked at the agriculture side in detail, but I believe the agriculture is, a, is one area where, according to Verite research, there has been a, a lower actual expenditure than uh, what has been budgeted. And I believe that has also been the case in some other sectors as well. Now, it, it's, it's certainly important to maintain those fiscal deficit targets, but it's also important to uh, allocate your expenditure accordingly in, so that we don't cut back on the priority area. So I think it, it's probably more prudent to uh, possibly make a, a more conservative revenue estimate so that then you're able to uh, make your uh, expenditure allocations uh, more targeted to the more uh, more relevant areas and I think it's unfortunate that we have seen in some cases uh, expenditure being cut back in areas where uh, it probably shouldn't have been. What about education? Now all the budget allocations for 2015 for the education sector have increased. We are yet to see any significant investment in that sector. Now shouldn't sectors like agriculture and education be more highly prioritized taking into account uh, a post-war economy? Well certainly I believe education is an area that needs to be very significantly prioritized. In this particular budget, there has been some improvements, particularly, I would say, in terms of uh, the increased allocation on uh, uh, expenditure for science laboratories. Uh, I think that has been an area that has been neglected. For example, if you look at uh, a number of schools that teach advanced levels, only around 10% of those schools have the facilities to teach uh, A-level science, largely because of the lack of facilities in terms of laboratories and so on. Also, it's important at the same time to build up uh, teacher capacity to be able to uh, to build to address that at, on the softer side as well. Um, so that is certainly a positive, and I think that is it, we should uh, acknowledge that. But at the same time, if you look at the edu education sector overall, I, I think it's not just the amount of expenditure that goes into the sector. I think overall, our education system needs a lot 
to uh, needs a lot of improvement. Um, we still have a very examination-based system where the focus is on the transfer of knowledge, whereas if you look at the knowledge economy that we aspire to be, the, what is demanded, the type of skills that are demanded in that type of more modern economy is not just the retention of knowledge, but the ability to, to, uh, to effectively use the abundant information and knowledge that is available out there, to be able to think creatively, to be able to challenge norms, to, uh, to be a questioning and debating mind. And I think those are the skills that we need to be really fostering. And that cannot be addressed just by increasing your expenditure on that. That needs to be addressed by a complete change in the culture of education uh, and a, a complete st uh, overall uh, overhaul of the, of the system that we have. I don't think that problem is unique to Sri Lanka. I think around the world we have this issue of changing education to meet uh, the, modern, the modern era. And I think certainly it's an area that we need to look at very seriously going forward if we uh, want to be a successful economy, given the kind of uh, economic structure that we aspire to have going forward. That was economist and LMB columnist Dashal Dimel. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.